After an insane few months to start off 2020, I gotta say, it is such a relief to have Rick and Morty back. Just something to provide a little bit of escapism, you know? Like, every day of 2020 seems to give us something new to worry about. First, there was the super virus, then the US government basically confirmed that aliens are real with declassified footage of UFOs, and if all of that wasn't enough, now we're hearing about these Asian giant hornets, massive insects that like to decapitate entire beehives and kill dozens of people a year. So will you excuse me for a bit while I both change and hornet proof my pants? Viruses, aliens, evil bees? Like I said, that is a lot to worry about. And you see, that's why Rick and Morty is so great. It's a show that is so far removed from reality that I can just sit and let those worries go and watch wacky sci-fi adventures about super viruses destroying the planet and invading alien species and human-sized wasps. Oh my god. Our whole reality is a Rick and Morty episode! Am I on the train? Am I on the story train? Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show that tells its passengers all aboard Matt Pat's crazy train. First stop, over Analysis Junction. So Rick and Morty is back, which means that I'm coming back with some quick explainer theories on the episodes that merit a closer look. And boy, oh boy, was the season four second half premiere titled Never Ricking Morty one that needed a bit more explanation. I mean, this show has always been meta, but this episode went off the rails in the meta department, which is ironic considering that the whole thing takes place on a train. Basically, we're given Rick and Morty stuck on a circular looping space train that, as Rick puts it, It's a story device. Literally. A literal literary device quite literally metaphorically containing us. To escape the train, they basically have to break out of the circular pattern of stories that constitute a typical Rick and Morty episode, all without sacrificing continuity or the integrity of the characters. They're captured by Story Lord, whose goal is to milk them dry of their endless potential for story. I don't know fuel my anthology with your limitless potential, propelling it to its final stop. Beyond the fifth wall. In order to defeat Story Lord, Rick has to resort to prayer, something that the characters Rick and Morty would never do, causing the train to come to a screeching halt. Because the turn to religion makes the characters much less popular and much less relatable, it breaks Story Lord's machine and they escape, only to then realize that the entire story train was a toy, something that Morty bought at the Citadel gift shop. The story train, available now on the Citadel of Rick's, just buy it! The episode ends with Rick praising Morty for buying merchandise, which he says is the most important thing. It's a fun episode, but boy, does it start to get complicated. So what does it all mean? What is canon? What is not canon? Unsurprisingly, the episode is a metaphor for the difficult, cyclical nature of writing the show Rick and Morty. But when you dig a little deeper, it's actually a lot more than that. It's a really complex exploration of how hard it is to write formulaic stories that still manage to please everyone, from the creators, to the viewers, to the theorists, to the networks and advertisers who ultimately make the show possible. ooh -wee, it's a deep dive analysis, so st st strap in tight, cause this little caboose is leaving the station. Woo woo! This is an episode with a lot of layers, so let's start with what's most obvious on the outside, the looping story train itself. The circular train is a reference to one of Dan Harmon's famous writing techniques known as his story circle. It's something that Harmon uses pretty religiously throughout his writing, having said before that he feels like it's tattooed in his brain. The Harmon story circle lays out the eight major steps of a complete dramatic story, and early on in this Rick and Morty episode, we're shown the blueprints for the train, and wouldn't you know it, it's broken up into eight parts. As Rick lays out his escape plan, he even points out how the specific beats of this episode are going to align to certain segments of the train. I'll have to rig us a couple of spacesuits that start failing around here, so we could pay a heavy price for re-entering at this threshold. It's steps three through six of the Harmon story circle. The characters get into an unfamiliar situation, they adapt to it, they get what they want, but they pay a heavy price. Now, that kind of formula, from a writing standpoint, can be a bit of a double-edged sword. On the plus side, it becomes pretty darn clear when you've got all the elements that you need to create a solid, coherent episode, but if the formula becomes something you absolutely have to follow every single time, you burn out your writers, you limit your ideas, you become predictable to the audience. In terms of this episode, staying on the train is staying formulaic. Going outside of the train, or derailing it completely, is breaking formula. Doing something drastically different. That tension of staying true to formula, but also stretching
changing what you can do really shows up throughout this episode. When Rick describes his plan to fix the story train's engine, Morty asks whether they'll have to leave the train. Rick responds with this. We don't have to do anything, Morty. This is just a structural guide. We're obviously going to impart our own style. The train in and of itself isn't a bad thing. You can always impart your own little twist on it. Likewise, there's always going to be a fear to leave the comfort of that train. Because in doing so, you run the risk of alienating the viewers who have just been enjoying the ride. That strict adherence to the formula is also what separates a typical Rick and Morty episode from their anthology episodes, like Interdimensional Cable and Morty's Mind Blowers. You know, the ones that have those short, random, heavily improvised vignettes. We get some hints from Rick that making anthology episodes full of fun little bits, but with no deeper meaning behind them would be potentially easier. Stop the anthology. If we wanted one-offs, we'd do Interdimensional Cable. But also less satisfying. Here's where the stupid vignettes were. God, imagine if that had been the whole thing. And yet when the writer's block starts to kick in, it must be tempting to want to lean on that style because it requires less intricate planning. After all, it's not like the interdimensional cable episodes are unpopular. Multiple sites that rank Rick and Morty episodes put the first interdimensional cable episode, Ricksty Minutes, in their top five episodes ever. Thrillist even has it at number one. But just because the stories might be easier doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna end up being faster. And sometimes the opposite, which seems to be the message of the exchange when Morty asks Rick why his spacesuit has a timer built in. Why would you put ticking Because if it's too easy to get there, we'll never get there. In other words, the constraints of story structure and deadlines are challenging, but ultimately useful in determining the way the narrative needs to go. Without a thoughtful story, Rick and Morty would never progress, and they would just dissolve into a bunch of random gags. Don't get me wrong, we all love a three-cheeked butt joke, it's just not a sustainable way to make a show. Big deal! You're probably saying at home, every writer has to think up stories. Big whoop, it's not worth complaining about. To which I say to you, you're on a tight ship there, imaginary viewer, who is himself a narrative device that I'm using to make a point. Is this real? But you're also missing some of the depth behind this issue. Making stories that are thoughtful and complete is only a small part of the total battle. Because in this day and age, especially for a show as successful as Rick and Morty, writers also have to worry about pleasing lots of different subsets of people, while making sure that those stories fit within that framework. And that is what the rest of this episode is about. One group that the writers have to worry about appeasing is, well, people like us. The fan base. The theorists. To say that Rick and Morty's fan base is passionate is a bit of an understatement. Any group of people who go bananas over the availability or lack thereof of chicken nugget dipping sauce is a group that perhaps cares just a wee bit too much. But that level of passion and that level of scrutiny puts a lot of pressure on the creators to deliver comprehensive answers about the world of Rick and Morty. What really sells this point home is when Rick tosses the tickets please guy out of the train. Rick explicitly tells Morty that everything outside of the train isn't canon. Don't worry Morty, nothing out there is canon. But later on in the show, we have an odd scene between two aliens, one of whom subscribes to a theory about the tickets please guy saying this. His followers believe the entire universe is floaty bloody man's nightmare as he dies in a time dilated reality. Okay, so this scene is symbolic of people who take non-canon information, spin it into their own theories, and then adhere to those theories as undeniable truth. Treating them almost as if they were a religion. You're given a piece of information, in this case a floating torso spinning through space, and three steps down the line, you concoct a wild explanation for what it could possibly mean, placing so much emphasis and emotional importance on it that you get it tattooed onto your own body when, in reality, none of it was canon to begin with. Now, I'd be lying if I said I hadn't made similar leaps in logic in my interpretation of the characters and episodes and easter eggs in the past. I mean, it's just fun to look at puzzling things in the stories we consume and think about what the complete complete story or inspiration behind it really is. That's why you're watching this video and hopefully why you're subscribed to this channel. And if you're not subscribed to this channel, now is a perfect time to do so because there is a whole heck of a lot of Rick and Morty discussion coming up over the next five weeks. It's just fun theorizing, you know? And that's not what the writers are calling out here. The problem that the writers are calling out is when those fun theories are treated like truth. When fans get so emotionally attached to those fabricated stories that they create a religious set of beliefs around them, that they're not willing to go with changes in the story direction based on what the writers want to do. Providing the level of detail to answer every question about every backstory and unexplained narrative, not only is it unrealistic for a writer, it's impossible to do within the confines of an episodic structure. Notice how Rick literally blows holes in the religious alien's theory. It's a pretty brilliant rebuttal in the animation to his theory on floaty bloody man's true 
role in this universe. This also aligns pretty well with how Rick and Morty's staff tends to handle outside theories. Dan Harmon said in an interview with GQ that the writers don't make any decision about canon until things actually happen in the show, and also that he avoids fan theories completely because he'd hate to have his own ideas corrupted by someone else's. Having a rabid fan base that celebrates and theorizes your work is a blessing, but it also puts pressure on the writers to continue coming up with ideas that are both unexpected while still logical extensions of the story for its characters. On a more personal note, by the way, I hope that anyone from the Rick and Morty staff who might be watching this episode will find it sufficient to disprove any of my theories through their scripts and won't resort to ripping me in half, tossing me in space, and shooting me with laser beams. I don't want to go like tickets, please, guy. And heck, I don't even have the abs to pull it off. Anyway, there's an additional element of pressure for the writers of Rick and Morty to navigate, and that's political correctness, of all things. That might come as a surprise to you, but Rick and Morty and its fandom have been on the receiving end of a decent amount of criticism about their exemplification of toxic masculinity. With all that baggage must come a desire to improve the show's image as inclusive and diverse, and that's where you get the bit about the Bechdel test in the middle of the episode. If you're not familiar with it, the Bechdel test is a tool to measure gender inclusivity in fiction, a movie or book or show that doesn't feature two female characters discussing something other than a man fails the Bechdel test. So when Morty tells an awkwardly sexist story about his mother and sister fighting lady scorpions with their laser-powered special time, the episode technically passes the Bechdel test, but it does it in the strangest way possible. Now, I don't think that this story in this episode is meant to convey that the makers of Rick and Morty think the Bechdel test is dumb or somehow couldn't fathom stories involving two women talking about anything other than men, but rather they're trying to point out yet another factor that the writers now have to juggle. And finally, there's the metaphor of Story Lord himself. Sure, Story Lord as a character represents the literal stories that Rick and Morty's creators have to wrestle with, but based on his behavior and motives, it seems like Story Lord might also represent another entity that the makers of Rick and Morty have to appease, network executives. Story Lord's machine that he locks Rick and Morty into has a number of metrics, including marketability, relatability, and broad appeal, that he then attempts to maximize by stealing stories from Rick and Morty that tap into their limitless potential, to take them beyond the fifth wall. It's not hard to see this as an analogy for a network or movie studio that wants to take a successful property and milk it dry until there's nothing left to extract. It all culminates with Story Lord menacingly asking if Rick and Morty want to see how their story ends, but this isn't some cheeky call out to how Rick and Morty is actually going to end. It's a scene featuring a showdown between an army of Meeseeks, spear-wielding Rick clones and Gazorpazorps led by evil Morty and a Palpatine-esque Mr. Poopy Butthole against Rick and Morty, and it ends with the literal deus ex machina of Jesus Christ coming in to save the day. It's not so much that this is how Rick and Morty will end, but more that the makers of the show fear that it'll end this way if they lose creative control over their process, and instead have to make stories that are forced to max out relatability, marketability, and broad appeal, sacrificing their integrity along the way. While that epic climactic battle doesn't explicitly reference any series, <coughs> Game of Thrones, <coughs> the fear of getting worn out or having to up the stakes to a ridiculous degree is clearly a real worry for these writers who have to appease the powers that be to stay on the air. Notice that Story Lord's machine doesn't measure quality, it only measures the metrics that'll lead to a show being successful and profitable. So finding the balance between satisfying a network, satisfying the fans, while still writing compelling, challenging stories that are creatively satisfying complicates the entire process. And that is the question at the center of this episode. How do you please everyone? How do you bring back crowd favorites like Mr. Meeseeks, or Bird Person, or Crumbopulous Michael without sacrificing narrative continuity? How can Rick and Morty, a show with a small niche audience, be profitable without selling out the complexity and specificity that made it great in the first place? Our answer lies in going beyond that fifth wall that Story Lord mentions. In my research, I found a few different definitions of a fifth wall, as the divide between critics and creator, or the difference between characters and the people playing them, but I don't think that's what Story Lord is meaning in this case by fifth wall. Rick and Morty has often broken the fourth wall. They have the characters acknowledge that they're in a show, but the barrier between the narrative and the viewer can actually be broken down yet another step. What is the purpose of a story? What is the purpose of its characters? The ultimate purpose is to make money, to sell things. We're no longer watching a narrative with characters, we're watching a marketing device called Rick and Morty meant to sell things. Their own merchandise, Pringles, Wendy's. This results in a weird monologue from Rick about how proud he is of Morty for buying something, or to put it in his cynical yet praiseworthy words, You didn't ask questions or raise ethical complaints, you, you 
just looked straight into the bleeding jaws of capitalism and said, yes, daddy, please. The voice in that writing is clearly sarcastic, but the point still stands that the success of any show hinges on its ability to sell products, either directly or indirectly by running ads around it. Notice that there is no real cold open for this episode. I don't know about your viewing of it, but for me, it was a Wendy's ad for breakfast sandwiches. A Wendy's ad for breakfast sandwiches that was produced by the Rick and Morty staff. At the midpoint of the episode, one of the ads was a Morty bot eating Pringles. And that's the point. That is the fifth wall. The writer of the episode, Jeff Loveness, tweeted that this was all about, quote, being trapped in the narrative choke of capitalism. Which is to say that the best stories don't necessarily make the most money, and also the most money-making stories often aren't the best. The problem is that Rick and Morty isn't designed to be a number one show. Rick and Morty isn't a warm and fuzzy family sitcom that can make lots of money with safe comedy living on a big network because it's too cynical, it's too dirty, it's too niche and too political. All things that hurt the show's scores for relatability, marketability, and broad appeal from Story Lord's machine. But they also can't suddenly shift to a formula designed for profit because that's against the soul of what Rick and Morty is. Sacrificing the identity of the show is ultimately parallel to just doing easily made, easily digestible anthology episodes that don't really stand for anything, which is what Rick was complaining about from the very beginning of the episode. And therefore, I will go to storytrain.com to purchase the merchandise as I've been instructed to by Rick and the link is broken. The story train that they advertised at the end of the episode doesn't exist. Dang it! And I was so mentally prepared to help him sell out too. Oh well, Wendy's breakfast sandwiches will have to do. That biscuit did look really good and he carries a mean pipe. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And speaking of shameless advertising, next Rick and Morty episode, Tuesday the 19th, we'll be talking portal science with the biggest science celebrity on the planet, Neil deGrasse Tyson. That's actually coming up on Tuesday the 19th, so mark your calendars, or like I said earlier, hit the subscribe button so you're here for what is honestly a huge collaboration on this channel. I'm really excited about it. Now, if I could only get Bill Nye on one of my shows, then my bingo board is complete. I'll see you in a few days for a new Scooby-Doo theory. Yeah, we're covering Scooby-Doo. And then more Rick and Morty next week, Tuesday the 19th, with my new best friend, Neil deGrasse Tyson. It'll be super nerdy, also super cool. So hope to see you there.